enumerated that it uh, follows a non-alignment path, that it sides with progressive uh, movements and social struggles throughout the third world in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and that um, to foreign military alliances detrimental to the struggles of third world people, and that it underlines it would not allow in future free Eritrea foreign military bases in its land. On 24 May 1991, uh, four years after the second Congress of the EBLF, that is, with total military defeat of the Ethiopian military junta, or known as the Derg, Eritrea achieved its de facto independence. Two years later, on 24 May 1993, after a UN-supervised referendum, Eritrea became formally independent state and joined the family of nations uh, in the United States. And uh, the loss of lives, the loss of property, damage to the infrastructure, and what have you. The EPLF quickly mobilized all its resources and embarked on a comprehensive nation-building process of recovery and rehabilitation. Three years after independence, the EPLF held its third congress from 10 to 16 February in 1994 at the historic town of Nakfa, which was its uh, uh, major stronghold during the liberation struggle. At this congress, the EPLF changed its name to reflect the situation, the post-independence situation, and formally became known as the People's Front for Democracy and Justice, or PFDJ for short, and it drew up its national charter, a roadmap with six basic goals and accompanying six basic principles. And I outline the six basic goals of the national charter first. One, national unity. Two, political democracy. Three, economic and social development. Four, social justice, meaning economic and social democracy. Five, cultural revival. And six, regional and international cooperation. <coughs> and parallel with this, its six basic principles would be one, national unity. Two, active popular participation. Three, decisive role of the human factor. Four, dynamic relationship between the national struggle and the social struggle, that is the struggle for social justice. Five, self-reliance in all fields, be it political, economic, and cultural. And number six, a strong relationship between people and the leadership. Essentially, the National Charter of 1994 is a renewed commitment to the all and try and proven goals and principles of struggle that enabled the EPLF to achieve victory against overwhelming odds. The PFDJ and the government of Eritrea remain steadfast in their vision to build a democratic, just and developed society. And the second uh, sub-topic, post-independence portrayal of Eritrea in Western mainstream media. In order to understand the, the current hostilities we are facing in the West, primarily here in the US, it is essential to see what has been the portrayal of Eritrea in those first years of post-independence, that is 1991 to 1997. Lest some forget the current relentless demonization of Eritrea in the Western mainstream media has not always been the case. I will cite a few examples to show the stark difference. And here I'm going to quote from major uh, newspapers and uh, news media. Africa's newest nation, Little Eritrea, has become an unlikely oasis of peace and civility waged between the clan fighting of Somalia and religious war in Sudan. Secretary of State Warren Christopher calls Eritrea a beacon of hope astride the Horn of Africa. Eritrea is beginning to develop without corruption so common elsewhere on the continent. This was from the Wall Street Journal of 31 May 1994. Another quote, 
Eritrea is virtually without peer in Africa as it pursues its own model of development and vision of democracy. Who is to say that Eritrea will not again surprise the world as it seeks to liberate itself from poverty? Financial Times, 18 January 1996. Eritrea is being seen as a model of, for the reintegration, regeneration of a whole continent. This country could be one of the biggest success stories. The national sense of purpose, the discipline of its people, the hard work, which is evident in the countryside, gives us cause for hope. The government has also been financially responsible in the use of its resources. This is the Washington Times. You can get far further right than the Washington Times, 14 September 1996. Eritreans are nationalistic and cohesive to a fault. They don't want to be slaves to any foreign donor country. They want economic self-sufficiency and they want to do it their way and with their own blood and sweat. This is the Globe and Mail, 26 April 1997. And if I'm not mistaken, the Globe and Mail is a South African publication or is it British? I will start to be corrected, but uh, it's, it's not an American publication. <coughs> Eritrea is embarking on a campaign to abolish food aid and stand on its own feet. From the ruins of war, which cost more than 250,000 lives on the Eritrean side alone, the Eritreans are transforming their new nation into a country that works. Africa Today, May, June issue of 1997. Little Eritrea has proved to be a model. Eritrea's success is all the more striking because the new government fended for itself for the most part and succeeded. The Los Angeles Times, 27 April 1998. In Africa, a continent ripe with wars, revolutions and depression and increasingly regarded as an economic and social basket case, there is one country that is reversing the trend and today is the democratic hope of the continent. It is Eritrea, as one who has reported from a score of African countries over the past 40 years, I have no hesitation saying that Eritrea is unlike anything I have encountered in Africa. I would just about, uh, just about given up on Africa as hopeless until seeing this country. Now I have renewed hope. <laughs> and this is the Toronto Sun. The, the writer is a, a journalist named Peter Worthington very conservative uh, right-wing guy so sometimes getting endorsement from people like that uh, for me coming from the progressive radical stance <laughs> is a cause for worry while the above quoted laudatory reports of Eritrea are by no means exhaustive it gives us a general picture of a positive picture of Eritrea at peace with itself and focused on development this brief honeymoon period of the West vis-a-vis -vis Eritrea was to be short-lived, however. Shortly after the border war with Ethiopia, with the Ethiopian minority regime of Mendes Denawi, a barrage of negative press against Eritrea started and continues to this day. I will not bore you with lengthy quotes of this demonization propaganda campaign against Eritrea. Suffice to say that Eritrea in the past 15 years ever since the outbreak of war with Ethiopia in 1998 is being labeled as a pariah state or sometimes the North Korea of Africa isolationist, spoiler, the most repressive nation on earth and so on and so forth Why the change of tone? As far as Eritrea is concerned, nothing has changed on the fundamental issues of its commitment to nation building, development, social justice and democracy, peaceful coexistence with its neighbors, non-alignment and proactive engagement with the international community based on the principles of mutual respect and non-interference in internal affairs. In fact, the positive treatment of Eritrea in the first six years of its independence was, in my opinion, to entice it from its independent national development path and turn it into just another subservient client state in Africa. Once it became clear that Eritrea would not budge from its steadfast commitment towards independent and self-reliant 
national political and economic policy, however, the propaganda tone changed. For the past 15 years, demonization and vilification of Eritrea became a staple diet of the mainstream corporate Western media. In the words of Noam Chomsky, the reason is simple. Eritrea was seen as the threat of good example. Noam Chomsky says, and I quote, No country is exempt from this treatment, no matter how unimportant. In fact, it is the weakest, poorest countries that often arouse the greatest hysteria. The weaker and poorer a country is, the more dangerous it is as an example. So, uh, it doesn't surprise me then that the past 15 years uh, is not because uh, Eritrea changed policy or discovered uh, you know, dictatorship or what have you. The reason is simple and fair. It is seen as a threat of, of good example or as a virus, as some would say, that could spread elsewhere in Africa. If that happens, God forbid what will happen to the interests of uh, the global corporations and uh, the rich countries of the West. So they don't want that. As a result, the relentless uh, vilification of Eritrea. Subtopic 3. What is the reality in Eritrea? In an article titled, We Should Learn from, the different, from different Development Models of uh, August 2011, just last year, British development, British development expert Dr. Gordon Peters had this to say about the Eritrean experience. And you will forgive me if I quote him at length because it provides sharp contrast to the demonization campaign that's currently going on. In the past, and this is what uh, Gordon, Dr. Gordon Peters says, in the past two to three years, I have been to two very different countries, and both of which one hears very little in the discourses of development. One is Paraguay in Latin America. And he gives uh, examples of uh, Paraguay. The other country is Eritrea, where the philosophy and practice of self-sustainability is being put in place countrywide. In semi-arid terrain in the Horn of Africa, following a brutal civil war with Ethiopia and an unresolved border truce policed by the UN. And significantly without donor aid. Eritrea's current one-party state, but with some evident participatory democracy, clearly does not fit with the geopolitical aims of the developed world governments and at least as much as the Eritrean government has said no thanks to donors, aid and dependency. But the point is that in a region of Africa where millions are again starving and donor aid is large and complicated in its distribution and its onward value and redirection there is a country managing to restore its terrace agricultural land to reforest, to help returnees set up land holdings, to educate children and give women an equal say in economy and society, and to extract something like 6% of profits from mining companies for social development. And of course of Dr. Gordon Peters. In fact, the last point he mentioned, um, Eritrea's mining policy and its mining laws are the most progressive in the continent of Africa. Elsewhere, for the past 50 years of post-independence, the huge mining corporations have literally been looting the wealth of Africa, leaving the continent devastated, ecologically uh, damaged, uh, with very little uh, of the wealth of these mineral resources trickling down to the, popul the African population. In Eritrea, however, um, you know, this is being reversed and other countries are starting to emulate. Again, as Chomsky pointed out earlier, the threat of a good example. Having lived and worked in Eritrea for the past 10 years, I can bear witness to the accuracy of Dr. Gordon Peters' take on Eritrea. Every year, Eritrea steadily climbs up the ladder of the UNDP's Human Development Index. Eritrea is one of the three African countries that is on target as far as 
reaching the UN's Millennium Development Goal or MDG that was passed back in 2000 uh, to be accomplished by 2015. So in this Millennium Development Goal, besides Eritrea, only two other countries. I think one is Botswana, the other, if my memory doesn't fail me, is either Ghana or Rwanda are on target achieving all the eight uh, Millennium Development Goals. And the Millennium Development Goals are such as reduction of infant death or mortality, uh, women's uh, rights, uh, universal primary education, access to healthcare, eradication of HIV AIDS, uh, malaria and other communicable diseases and so on and so forth. Uh, very lofty goals that were set in 2000 and Eritrea is very much on target in having achieved almost uh, in all of the eight targeted goals uh, a lot of uh, significant uh, accomplishments. All this accomplishment by Eritrea was registered despite the brutal war that the Ethiopian minority regime unleashed on Eritrea in 1998 to 2000 and the recent U.S.-imposed United Nations Security Council sanctions of 2009 and 2011. I will not go into details about the harsh hostilities that Eritrea has been faced with in the past 15 years of its existence, as they are too well known to this audience. Eritrea has abided by international laws and agreements and respect the sovereignty and independence of its neighbors. The pretext for the war against Eritrea by the TPLF regime of Meles Zenawi in 1998 was ostensibly the border issue and the town of Badr. This war cost on both sides uh, 100,000 lives. That's a very conservative estimate. Uh, a huge devastation to both countries, a uh, senseless war, um, but it was fought against Eritrea's uh, will. And it was supposed to be resolved by the peace treaty of Algiers, which was signed in December of 2000. The U.S. was the sole force behind the peace process and the author and guarantor of the Algiers treaty itself. If you remember, then uh, former National Security Advisor Anthony Lake was the chief uh, negotiator and people like Susan Rice and, and Gail Smith and others were in that uh, U.S. peace team. They authored uh, the agreement and they forced both sides to sign the agreement at Algiers in December 2000. In accordance with the peace agreement, a neutral body of arbitration called the Eritrea Ethiopia Boundary Commission, whose ruling in accordance with Algiers Treaty was to be final and binding. And both countries, with their eyes open, knowing in advance that the ruling of the Hague Court would be final and binding, signed the agreement. Eritrea has accepted the EEBC's ruling, which was rendered in April of 2002. Ten years later, however, sadly, the regime of Mendes Denawi rejected it, with, rejected it and continues to reject it with impunity and continues its hostile provocations against Eritrea with U.S. backing. In a typical fashion of inverting the victim and the aggressor, the U.S. and Mendes Denawi's Ethiopia, its favorite puppet regime in Africa, have brought to the UN bogus charges unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated against Eritrea for aiding and abetting Somali insurgents and imposed sanctions on it. While Ethiopia, that flaunts international agreements and invades Somalia, is let off scot free and even rewarded to the, tunes, to the tune of billions of dollars in economic and military aid. Why this? Uh, again, as I said, the threat of the good example is the primary cause, but also Mendes Zenawi's Ethiopia is the favorite client state of the United States in Africa. The United States has drone bases there. Uh, it conducts military to military training. I will not go into length about that because I believe uh, Brother Glenford will address that issue. And also uh, Brother Efrem Manigo will talk about that, I hope. But this is the key uh, that, that Eritrea has been passing through. It is on the right, has fulfilled all its obligations. It wants peaceful uh, resolution of the conflict, the border to be demarcated in accordance with the uh, Boundary Commission's ruling. Uh, 
have you not done all that it has been asked from it? However, Eritrea still finds itself being punished. Again, simply for not being subservient and wanting to pursue its own independent national path of economic development. Concluding remarks. Eritrea, however, remains engaged in its commitment towards regional peace and stability, which it sees as essential foundation building blocks to achieving economic integration and cooperation. In the era of corporate-driven globalization, regional trade blocks and economic integration of the economies of third world countries, especially African countries, are necessary prerequisites to escape marginalization, poverty, and underdevelopment. Towards this end, Eritrea's recent positive engagement with the Sudan is a good start, and this needs to be explained, expanded to include all member countries of the IGAD, such as Ethiopia, Djibouti, Somalia, uh, Kenya, and Uganda. Essentially, Eritrea is very much committed and be believes in earnest that unless these poor underdeveloped countries find peace and stability in their region and establish uh, fruitful economic integration, they will not be able to escape exploitation and marginalization in the era of globalization. However, uh, because of continued foreign military intervention in the area, continued chaos and wars, uh, Eritrea's uh, vision, correct vision of economic development today has not found credible partners. I am not going to talk at length about Eritrea's relationship currently with uh, the Ethiopian opposition movements, which is positive. Uh, many of the opposition movements, uh, I believe, have credible uh, relationships with Ethiopia. Most of them uh, acknowledge the sovereignty and independence of Eritrea and want to engage in a future uh, step in Ethiopia uh, that avoids wars. Ethiopia rightly is a, is a big country, 80 million strong. Uh, it can become the driving powerhouse if correctly governed and if uh, you know, democratic governance uh, which is free from ethnic conflicts and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, towing the foreign interests of other uh, great powers, if that kind of Ethiopia comes into place, I believe both Eritrea and Ethiopia will live in peace and they will have uh, much to benefit from uh, you know, economic integration and cooperation. So with that, I conclude my remarks um, and I yield the balance of my time if I have a few minutes remaining to my colleagues. I thank you very much. Our